Good afternoon. Welcome to New America. Um, today is the launch of our uh, study together with Air Wars, uh, a look examining the air war uh, in Libya from 2012 to today uh, and the effects on uh, civilian casualties and uh, the um, kind of outlines uh, the multiple foreign countries and local players that are involved in this aerial conflict. We have an excellent panel that will be moderated by uh, Lisa Sims, who was one of the authors of the report. Um, and we also have from London, uh, from the United Kingdom, Chris Woods, who directs Air Wars, and Oliver Eimhoff, who was integral to the research. And finally, uh, Jonathan Weiner, who was the US envoy uh, under the Obama administration to Libya, uh, who will provide some expert commentary. So I'm handing it over to Lisa now. Hi, welcome. Uh, we're going to actually show a video really briefly from one of our researchers who uh, he's actually Libyan and, and based in, in the UK. And he wasn't able to make it, unfortunately, to help present with us. So we wanted to give him some time to, to say a few words. Hello, everyone. I'm Osama Mansour. I was born and raised in Libya. Last year, I joined the interesting project at Air Wars with the three other great Libyan researchers. When, as, when I was initially contacted by Air Wars, I was explaining it regarding the project. I said to myself, this is an amazing opportunity to be part of this first work for Libya. Our whole aim is to eliminate a forgotten conflict using incredible data which the team has been working very hard for nearly a year by now. It's notable that the majority of Libyans use Facebook with an estimated 2 million users across the country, which is one third of the population. In a contrast, Twitter is used mainly by Libyan politicians. The team has carefully assisted the local sources and their political affiliations. This include the TV channels, electronic newspapers, activists and politicians and official pages of armed groups. I am very disappointed not to be with you in person to present our findings as I was refused entry to the US under Trump administration travel ban. This is sad for all Libyans not to be presented in such a key new project about their own country. Thank you very much. Um, so now we're going to give uh, our researcher Oliver some time to give a presentation on uh, our, the results of our study. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks to Osama, first of all. Shame that he can't be here. And uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks to everyone for coming to not, uh, today and showing interest in our Libya project. Uh, so I'm going to present our findings here briefly. Uh, so altogether, we monitored 2,162 airstrikes since um, 2012, we took the end of the NATO campaign in 2011 uh, as a cutoff date because we were interested in what happened after the NATO campaign and uh, how Libya evolved after the conflict. And uh, we have a total count of a minimum of 243 and a maximum of 395 civilian, alleged civilian casualties now. Uh, if you look into the report and our webpage, the numbers might slightly change because the conflict is ongoing and there's still strikes occurring. Um, yeah, so uh, here you can see our belligerents. Uh, Libya is an extremely complex conflict. Um, you can see the free Libyan belligerents at the top, which is the Libyan government of national accord, the uh, internationally recognized government. And uh, here the Libyan National Army, which uh, by far conducted the most strikes. And the Libyan General National Congress, that doesn't exist anymore, that split off from the elected government in 2014. And 
Then we have various international actors here, which uh, also includes Israel, which only uh, was involved in one, one incident uh, conducting two strikes, which didn't uh, result in any civilian casualties, so we didn't list them here. And yeah, we have Egypt, France, the UAE, uh, the US, and um, then one major issue we faced in Libya was that there were a lot of joint and contested strikes, which means, for example, joint strikes would be strikes conducted by the LNA together with Egypt or uh, the UAE, which supports them, or for example, also the GNA together with the US as their also allies. And uh, contested events would be events where um, uh, sources claim different belligerents, so that was also a thing that happened quite often that sources, for example, said um, strikes were conducted by France or the UAE or Egypt. Uh, so we had to sum them up and you can see that it's quite a high amount of alleged civilian fatalities. Um, so you can see like once civilian casualties occur, usually the number of alleged belligerents also go up because no one wants to be responsible for strikes. Um, yeah, I, I uh, talked a bit about the numbers already. So the Libyan National Army uh, has by far conducted the most strikes and has also the highest rate of civilian casualties. Um, then the US follows with the second highest number of strikes. Uh, so here again, you can see the total number of strikes. Um, so here you can see after the end of the revolution that uh, Libya was pretty quiet in 2012 and 2013. Um, then in 2014, the GNC and the LNA split from, from the government and the second civil war started. Around that time also ISIS, ISIS started showing up and in 2015, for example, ISIS took over uh, third. Uh, from the LNA and other minor forces back then. And uh, yeah, then you can see a massive spike in strikes in 2016, which is mostly attributed to the LNA, which you can see here, and the US, which you can see here. So that represents the third campaign conducted by the US together with the GNA. And uh, the LNA at that time was uh, fighting Islamist militias, mostly in Benghazi and Derna. And then uh, 2017 was also quite a strong year in terms of airstrikes, but uh, the, the numbers slightly decreased towards the end of the year due to the uh, political agreement in Libya, which um, yeah, resulted in a more peaceful situation. So especially regarding the US, you can see a massive decrease in strikes here. The LNA was still quite heavily bombing there, Egypt as well, for example. And then in 2018, we again have tracked much less strikes as uh, there's only fighting going on in, in uh, various areas of the country, but many less than in the years before. Um, yeah, and in terms of um, civilian fatalities per belligerent, uh, yeah, you can see that the, the LNA is by far the strongest actor there, as I said before. Uh, one of the most interesting results from our study is uh, also that the US conducted 25% of the strikes, but is only responsible for 4% of the civilian harm events. Um, yeah, which is very interesting as uh, in most of the strikes by the US were conducted in CERT, so in an urban area, which usually leads to a higher toll of civilians. But you can really say that, that the, um, the US precision strikes work there and were much more exact than the strikes, for example, used by the LNA, which also heavily bombs in urban areas, for example, in Benghazi and Derna, uh, which uses old jets, non, doesn't use precision strikes, and often bombs in residential areas. Uh, because of that, we're actually quite surprised that the number of LNA strikes isn't even higher because uh, of LNA civilian casualties isn't higher because um, the, it, it had such heavy bombing in urban areas that we actually expect a much higher number there. So we had many reports there, but uh, often not repo uh, no reports of civilians. 
which could be due to the reporting situation in Libya. Often the, the internet and the electricity is cut off so it's, and uh, journalists are cut from, from areas besieged by the belligerents so it's difficult for them to report there. Yeah, and here you can see the local distribution of uh, civilian fatality incidents. Uh, so you can see Libya's most densely populated areas are all at the coast because this area here is mostly desert. And uh, yeah, you can see the most heavy fighting was in Benghazi, Derna, and Sirte. Tripoli is actually the most densely populated area, but uh, there, were, there was not, not that much of fighting going on. Uh, so you can see here Benghazi definitely had the most incidents as it was very heavily besieged. Uh, yeah, Sirte and Derna is as well, then we have a few outliers here. This is Sapa, which is the biggest town in the south, where we also had a lot of civilian casualty incidents because it's exactly at the line between uh, LNA and GNA governance. GNA is here, LNA is here, and the Tuareg controlled territory is here, so there's usually a lot of fighting going on there. And then this area is also very interesting near the Egyptian border, uh, where Egypt is basically policing its border with its air force here, so around Kufa and uh, in the exact border area, there sometimes occur civilian casualties incidents as a result from the Egyptian air force bombing SUVs, which, of which it thinks they're terrorists or smugglers entering the country. Uh, another interesting thing in Libya was also that we had a lot of maritime strikes, um, which also mostly happened around this area in Benghazi, Sirt, and Derna of the coast, um, because most of the big, big cities are so close there that the um, belligerents usually expected uh, weapon smuggling or fighter smuggling there. Um, so there was a lot of bombing of, of boats. And of course, it's often difficult to tell like who's in a boat. So sometimes fishermen uh, were reported hit instead of smugglers or alleged terrorists. Uh, so that was a ma massive issue, and um, we also had the first uh, reported um, double tap maritime strike in a while there. Then another big issue we had with reporting was that um, the Libyan media is usually very focused on Libyan citizens there, uh, which is problematic as often uh, also sub-Saharan Africans were hit in strikes, uh, which mostly means Sudanese and Chadian people. And while the deaths of uh, Libyan civilians often make headlines, the, the death of uh, foreigners often just make footnotes, which is difficult, or sometimes they're even just reported in the Sudanese or Chadian media then. And uh, here you can see a typical case example, um, which is actually our latest civilian casualties allegation against the U.S. Uh, so the U.S. conducted a precision strike on ISIS near Bani Walid in, uh, on June 6th and claimed that it killed four members of the organization, including a senior member. And a lot of uh, local media reports conflicted with that and said that actually just the senior member was killed and the other three ones were civilians uh, and probably family members of him. And uh, then we got in touch with AFRICOM, which still denies the claim we have. But you, from this strike, you can see the conflict between local reporting we often have and the official statements we get from AFRICOM. And there you can also see um, the, the problem that this discrepancy between transparency and accountability poses. So AFRICOM is transparent here, but uh, often not accountable for the, for the strikes it conducted. Um, nevertheless, AFRICOM was, or the US was by far the most, account, uh, the most transparent belligerent we had here, as uh, it gave details on most of the alleged strikes against them. Uh, the other most account uh, the most transparent belligerent we had was the LNA, which published a lot of its strikes in 2016 on its social media page, which then unfortunately was deleted. So they went from very transparent to uh, completely intransparent. And then the other belligerent we have here, who is a bit transparent at least, is Egypt, 
which also sometimes uh, publishes strikes on its social media. And um, yeah, so we're happy to discuss this. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Oliver, for your uh, presentation. As, as you can see, it is a bit of a complex conflict, so hopefully we can, can do a little bit to, to break it down some more and, and get more into detail about the political context and some more of the context for these strikes. Chris, I wanted to uh, start with you, and if you could give us some, some more background behind the study and, and the significance of, of the air conflict in, in Libya right now. Yeah, uh, th thanks uh, everyone coming along today. Uh, when we first began looking at this, uh, Air Wars philosophically began uh, it, it, as a response to, to NATO's intervention in Libya back in 2011. Uh, at the end of that came, campaign, campaign, you might recall, um, Rasmussen, the then head of NATO, gave a press conference where he said no civilians were harmed during the NATO campaign. And that didn't really match what was reported out on the ground by Libyans themselves. The official UN uh, study of the war, uh, New York Times investigation, Human Rights Watch and others went in, and they did find some civilian harm, uh, up to around 100 civilians killed in that campaign. And I think we had had this challenge of militaries claiming absolute precision in war, uh, which, which was a big worry for us, and, and it led to us setting up air wars to monitor, for example, harm in Iraq and Syria, which is what we're best known for. Um, so when we went back and had a look at Libya, we wanted to understand what had happened in that country since 2012, since NATO had left. Clearly, there were security concerns for Libya. Clearly, Libyans themselves uh, uh, didn't have the security they'd hoped for after, after the uprising against Gaddafi. Uh, and it was a great opportunity for us to team up with New America uh, because of New America's pioneering work on CIA campaigns, for example, in Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia, and also their analytic clout to sort of put the two organizations together and to try and understand the reporting out of civilian harm in Libya from the perspective of Libyans themselves. Uh, it's a great shame that Osama wasn't able to be with us uh, here today. If it wasn't entirely clear, he was banned from entering the US overtly, unfortunately, as part of the travel ban. Uh, it was explicitly stated that he could not come uh, to present on our findings because he was Libyan. Uh, which is a great shame because our, our fantastic team of Libyan researchers have been working hard to illuminate this very challenging, complex uh, conflict. Um, and the US doesn't really come out of it as the bad guy. I mean, as you saw, the US is the most transparent, belligerent, uh, proportionally actually responsible for a relatively no lo low number of uh, civilian harm events, according to, to Libyans themselves. Um, so very sad that, uh, that the Libyan team uh, couldn't actually be here. Uh, but I think this study does represent the most comprehensive look at what's taken place in Libya uh, since NATO's departure. Uh, and I, I'm also uh, very pleased that this is an ongoing project between Air Wars and New America. This is something we aim to continue with. It's going to be a continuous monitoring project moving forward. Uh, and we are hopefully going to be able to continue to foreground the security concerns of uh, Libyans themselves. Just one final thing uh, I'd like to say. In our modeling of Iraq and Syria, we very much focus on international belligerence. As you saw from Oliver's presentation here, we wanted to understand what all belligerents uh, were doing. And, and again, that matters to Libyans themselves. Uh, the LNA is the primary source of civilian harm, and it would have simply been wrong for us only to focus on foreign actors uh, when domestic actors are responsible for so many problematic events in that country. Uh, so this is very much a project we want Libyans to feel ownership of. Uh, and which will, we hope, help improve their own security situation over time. And uh, you, just to follow up, you, you mentioned uh, your, your data on, on Iraq and Syria. And how does this compare in terms of, of the conflict and the, the number of civilian casualties? Yeah. I, I mean, Iraq and Syria, the, the, the war against so-called Islamic State is a, is a huge hot war. As you know, it's been running for almost four years now, more than 30,000 airstrikes by the US and its allies against ISIS, allegations of up to 26,000 civilian fatalities just from coalition actions. And mm 
tens of thousands more from other actors as well. It, it is a very bloody war. Uh, Libya is much closer to the kind of low intensity conflicts that New America has been tracking for, for many years now, for example, in places like Pakistan uh, and Somalia and the counter-terrorism actions of the US in Yemen, not the, obviously the hot Saudi war. The civilian harm, I mean, these are significant numbers. I mean, I, I, you know, it's clear that hundreds of civilians have been killed by airstrikes uh, since 2012. Uh, uh, Identifying exactly who is responsible at any one time can prove quite challenging. Uh, but these are not the high numbers we've seen reported out of Iraq and Syria. And, and that's partly to do with uh, the intensity of the conflict, partly to do with population density. Uh, but also, and, and this is a challenge, you know, uh, the study that we've presented today uses a particular methodology which is focused on, on what uh, Libyans themselves are reporting out. That information is quite vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we found for Iraq and Syria, for example, that significant amounts of locally reported information disappears quite quickly uh, from the internet. Towns are overrun, individuals are killed, websites are shut down, uh, YouTube purges videos and so on. So information is lost. So the, the bit that we're missing from this project is how much information we weren't able to capture because it simply wasn't reported out. And as an illustrator of what can happen in conflicts which are poorly reported locally, if we look at Iraq, um, where local reporting of civilian harm has been relatively poor during the war against ISIS, half of all the civilian harm events admitted by the US-led coalition were never publicly reported by any Iraqi at, at the time. So it's quite possible what we're showing you here is an underreporting of civilian harm. Uh, nevertheless, it is the best representation we have of what Libyans themselves have said and, and the information that we have available. Uh, Jonathan, so how did, we, how did we get to this point? So starting, starting at the intervention, um, after, after the fall of Gaddafi, you know, we, we have some, some militias on the ground who, who start to war among each other, and then we, we kind of get you know, a bit of a political process that leads to the GNC, but then the GNC doesn't work out, and, and how did we get to, to the GNA and the LNA and the way that the, the political landscape is now? In the aftermath of any civil war, you have what we used to call back in the 80s, a long time ago, the disposal problem. And the disposal problem is you've trained up an entire generation of people on uh, how to use guns and how to use guns against other people in the country. And many of the people, if they spent more than a, a short period of time with those guns, decide that it's great to be able to get paid for using guns. It's a, it's a teenage male fantasy uh, turned into reality. Wow, I've got guns. I'm part of a gang. A militia, after all, is not that different from a gang. Um, and I can use my guns to get what I want. Um, in Libya after the revolution, anyone who fought against Gaddafi or who said they fought against Gaddafi and was a member of a revolutionary thuar, or was a revolutionary freedom fighter, got put on the dole. You got per payments for forever without having to do any further work. So this became the foundation which became an economic basis for uh, the militias. If, by contrast, Libya had said we're going to make payments to every um, person who drove a taxi during the war, um, there would be an incredibly elaborate taxi system and no one would need to have cars anymore in Libya. But they did it for the revolutionary Thuar. So when you have gangs, and gangs already have money and are being taken care of, it's inevitable they're going to be turf wars. So that was part of the problem. Uh, separately, uh, Libyans were told for 42 years by Gaddafi that they were um, running the country, not him. Uh, his whole concept of government was direct will of the people. Speaking, I speak through them, I'm their voice. But in fact, they had very little power over their affairs. So after this is all over, they suddenly had to go to rep <coughs> representative government. They had no experience with representative government, no experience with compromise, uh, except at the local level where they knew one another. So at the national level, it was grab as much as you can. Deny your opponent's advantage, grab as much as you can yourself. This devolved to a situation where they put in place weaker and weaker and weaker yet prime ministers. The weak prime ministers pretty much um, allowed for uh, Libyan um, uh, governance to turn into opportunities for corruption. 
and people weren't able to get things done other than contracts, and then the money started running out. People started extorting money for uh, allowing oil to flow. Libya has no source of funds other than oil flow. And a very critical event happened in, I think, the summer of 2013, which was the um, decision to have a political isolation law that was passed by the GNC in Tripoli against Gaddafiites. Now, there are two labels in Libya which are used a lot. Neither of them are good labels. They're both offensive labels. Anybody who was a have under Gaddafi, including people who are the, uh, the absolute spine of the civil service and the technocrats, they're all Gaddafiites. And anybody who was a, uh, was a have not under the Gaddafi government and outside his system, well, they're the Islamists. So this was turned to Gaddafiites versus Islamists. Many of the Islamists, they're not Muslim Brotherhood particularly, and the Libyan Muslim Brotherhood was about as pluralist as any group I ran into, as it happened, and committed to constitution and laws as any group I ran into. Um, Islamist was a wide range from people who wanted Islamic law of the type that Islamic State would want, not too many of them, but some of them, uh, to people who wanted Islam to be part of the constitution, and that's about it and a wide range in between. People of all kinds of uh, backgrounds lumped in. The Gaddafiites were from people who wanted to see the Gaddafi family back in charge, to people who just wanted to, be, um, uh, to um, have the government uh, move east so they could get more boodle, uh, more, more of the funds, um, um, to people who were technocrats or well-educated. So these were really, really bad labels. But the Islamists kicked out all the Gaddafiites. And that was the beginning of the political conflict, which led to the division of the country into two competing feckless governments in 2014. There was a Libyan at an event uh, who attended an event with the then prime minister of the country, a fellow named Al Thini in 2014, spoke at a think tank here. And the Libyan turned to me, a Libyan American who, sp who studies Libya, and said, Jonathan, should I shoot myself in the head now or wait till I get home? And he was referring to the performance of Libya's then prime minister, right before the country divided, which was the worst performance I have seen of any senior political figure in Washington since I arrived here in January 1985. And I've seen a lot of them. The worst, sui generis, unique. He was, <laughs> yes, he was that bad. And after that performance, I went to another event with him uh, that was uh, semi-private, and he was worse than the next one. He wasn't there by accident. Um, lots of Libyans told me how in incapable he was. So they picked incapable people who wouldn't interfere with all the constituents who were there. What wound up happening was Egypt got, felt threatened. The Emiratis who were partnered with Egypt felt threatened. They had their flip around on the Muslim Brotherhood. So now the Islamists were the same as the Brotherhood. So now the Brotherhood was threatening Libyan democracy. And that uh, in turn enabled Khalifa Haftar, who announced a coup in February of uh, 14, a television coup just like Gaddafi, only this time nobody came. What happens if you announce a coup and nobody comes? Answer, you get a foreign sponsor who's going to give you weapons and support and money, which is what uh, Haftar did. And they didn't want Libyan revolutionaries and extremists coming to Egypt. And it was a problem. You had crazies, extremists who'd taken over Derna in the east, eastern coastal town. Um, they invited Islamic State in and said, come on in, teach us how to do it right. After that happened, after a very small number of months, they said, wait a minute, we don't want foreign extremists telling us what to do. And there was a bloody war in Derna between the Islamic extremists and the Islamic State. Domestic Libyan extremists and Islamic State. Now, there are other people from Derna who didn't want either one, but those are the people who were fighting, and the Libyans kicked out the foreigners. We don't want foreigners telling us what to do. This is Libya. So Libyans, by and large, don't want the Amer United States telling them what to do. I'm, I'm with them on that. Uh, let's agree on that. They don't want the Egyptians telling them what to do. The Emiratis, the Saudis, the Jordanians, the Qataris, the Turks, the Algerians, the Tunisians, the French, the Brits, especially the Italians. Um, they don't want it. But here's everybody involved. So why did everybody get involved in 2014? 2014, you had the so-called Islamists being supported by Qatar and Turkey and the so-called Qaddafi had being supported by Egypt, Emirates, a little bit Saudi Arabia. Um, that resulted in, in, in the locals saying, hey, we've got patrons. 
we just use our patrons to get as much advantage as we wanted. And that was disastrous. And the country started falling apart. It wasn't a civil war, in my opinion. It was a civil conflict, which was at risk of becoming a civil war. Now, last point I want to make on this part, and then we'll sort of go forward and to the airstrikes, because it's, it's what this is all about is airstrikes, right? Um, nobody went into Derna in this period of time. When the Derna's, uh, Derna extremists invited Al um, um, Islamic State in and they kicked them out, there weren't air campaigns from Westerners or anybody else. Libyans created that problem. Libyans solved that problem. An important thing to remember. As Haftar got going and refused to cut any deals to join the government of national accord, he was able to do that in part because he had foreign support, including billions of dinars provided by the government of Russia in 2016. Uh, in 2014, um, people began to realize the civil conflict wasn't going well. Um, that was a bad thing for everybody involved. And there began to be a big, broad movement by Libyans and by foreigners alike to come together um, in what became the government of the National Accord, because it wasn't good for the country to have the civil conflict. Now, individuals who had interests and were doing well from the civil conflict opposed it. Um, but ultimately, everybody came together. The patrons on both sides told their clients, you got a deal. You got a deal. So in that period of time, there were very few airstrikes, with the exception of the growing problem in Benghazi. Why was Benghazi such a problem? You had uh, Khalifa Haftar Unilara saying, I'm going to get the extremists, domestic Libyan extremists, not foreign ones, out of Benghazi and uh, replace them by my own military governor. And that caused people from Misrata, as well as people from Benghazi, people all the way to the west, Tripolitanians, saying, we don't want Khad uh, Khalifa Haftar telling Benghazi what to do. We'll come to the aid of our brethren. So you had Qaddafiites. Uh, and the, uh, people were going to, uh, they labeled Qaddafiites with Operation Dignity, now fighting in a genuine civil war within Benghazi against uh, the Islamists who came from outside Benghazi as well to join the ones in. It was a coalition from very extreme people to less extreme people. So the first big air campaigns mm -hmm. happened in Benghazi. They happened involving some of the foreign sponsors, mm -hmm. uh, Egypt and the Emirates. The UN experts report uh, specifies exactly what was going on in that period. That's resolved, except in Benghazi, by the Skarat Agreement at the um, end of 2015. 2016, the Russians come in and give the Eastern guys five billion, six billion in counterfeit Libyan dinars with no, over uh, no um, um, oversight, no accountability of any kind. Um, and in, this, in the process of all this, um, the Islamic State gets into cert. And that's where I want to go straight to the air campaign, and I'm going to stop. Islamic State finds a window. They're having problems now in Iraq and Syria. Even as they're expanding in Iraq and Syria, they go to Libya as a second safe haven, as a place to start it up again in, uh, as an insurance policy, in part. They commit horrible atrocities that they then put online. This actually started in 2015 and played a big role in the government of the National Accord coming to exist, because Libyans and foreigners alike felt very threatened by what was going on in the Islamic State and did not know how broadly it was going to spread. And they were slaughtering people, cutting their throats on the beach and videotaping it. Absolutely intolerable. And they, were, uh, intolerable. And they were kidnapping and killing foreigners at the same time. So why do you have an airstrike campaign? What's the reasons for it? Well, the reason for Khalifa Haftar's was to take over Benghazi, reclaim Benghazi from extremists and uh, people he called Islamists. And he needed airstrikes to do that. Egypt was doing it to keep the Muslim Brotherhood out of Egypt and to make sure that the East couldn't be used as a platform back to retake Egypt. Qatar and Turkey weren't doing airstrikes. They didn't show up in your chart. So we've now talked about um, the genesis of the Libyan um, National Army, and we've talked about what the Egyptians thought they were doing and what the um, uh, Emiratis thought they were doing. What did the Americans think they were doing? The Americans saw al-Qaeda, Ansar al-Sharia, al mar Batum, and Islamic State terrorist training camps who were exporting terrorism to Algeria, to Chad, to Tunisia, to kill um, ordinary civilians, having trained in Libya. And the United States began to see where they were training. And the United States spent time thinking about it at the very senior policy levels. How do we deal with this? We don't have a lot of Americans at this point wandering around Libya. It's too dangerous, and it's not really going to work. You know, the the cost-benefit ratio of going in and trying to root them out with commandos is probably not going to work. And you're at risk of getting drawn into a civilian situation, 
or, or uh, Lord knows what. So the answer, which the United States has come to in recent years, is you do targeted surgical strikes on camps where you know they are and take them out individually. President Obama was extremely concerned about this not resulting in civilian deaths and put in place extraordinarily stringent rules, which our, was, uh, our, our military, including people who actually had hair, were pulling their hair out because it was so difficult to figure out how to do it at the level that President Obama was insisting on. And the terrorist strikes were being micromanaged out of the NSC, strike by strike by strike. Lots of questions being asked. How do we know there aren't school kids near? How do we know that this, th this isn't really a school, isn't really a this, isn't really a that? Very detailed questions. When two, um, um, uh, let me think what country it was, Serbs, when two Serbs were killed after raids in Sabrata where we had particular terrorists we were going after, I was utterly certain at, the, at first that we must have killed the two Serbs. They were there, we'd done an airstrike, their bodies were found there. Our military said, no, we think we didn't. I said, oh, come on. How could this be true? It's pretty obvious. They said, I think, we think actually that they were killed by terrorists and brought in there and may have it made to look by us. I said, yeah, right. I then looked at the evidence they provided me, and bit by bit by bit, I got convinced by a variety of specifics. A, I can't remember them, and B, if I could, I probably couldn't tell you. But I, I actually became convinced from extreme skepticism to believing the account. I did not feel deceived. I did not feel manipulated. I asked every tough question. They had a lot of information. So what were we trying to do? We were trying to kill terrorists. Stop terrorists from killing people who they were planning on killing, not only in Libya, but externally. Right. And I think that's actually uh, a, good, a good place to pause, because um, I know that you guys, uh, Chris and Oliver, have, have been in contact with AFRICOM about trying to to, uh, to get them to in investigate some of these claims of civilian casualties. And what has that experience been like, and what has that response been? I mean, I, so we, we have found AFRICOM, as, as Oliver said in his presentation, and certainly the most transparent, belligerent uh, we shared uh, with AFRICOM prior to publishing the report, uh, our data on uh, uh, reported and alleged US strikes, and also claim civilian casualty events so that they could have a look at that. And, and the US was the only belligerent to come back to us uh, and actually engage on civilian harm, and we, we certainly appreciate that. Um, as part of their response, AFRICOM identified two events that they have recently investigated. Unfortunately, to this point, they won't tell us which, of, which incidents they actually investigated. Um, and we are working with AFRICOM to see if we can get them up to the same level of transparency that we're getting from CENTCOM. Uh, for mm -hmm. example, for um, inherent resolve in Iraq and Syria. Um, I, I think picking up on your point about, about the precision strikes, I think that's absolutely true that great care was taken. I think for CERT, and maybe Oliver can talk about this a bit, about the challenges our research team had, CERT was different from everything else. So the strikes the US is still doing in Libya are very much counter-terrorism strikes, usually against high-value targets, um, very carefully taken strikes, usually against moving vehicles, moments chosen to absolutely minimize civilian harm. It's very similar to the pattern that um, uh, Peter and co. have been tracking here for years in, in, in other uh, CT theaters. CERT, though, was a heavy bombing campaign. It was 500 US airstrikes in five months. Uh, interestingly, 60% of them by uh, Reaper drone, as we found out after the event. Um, and it was only at the end we found out quite how many families uh, had been uh, uh, there of the ISIS fighters, and more broadly, how many civilians had, had remained trapped in particular neighborhoods. And we still can't say with certainty how many civilians died. And Oliver, I, if you maybe want to talk about the, the challenges our researchers had digging into what was happening at CERT. I know you've written a very strong piece on this as well. Yeah. So the main, the main issue in CERT was what I mentioned before already, that um, the, um, the electricity and the communications channels were cut off there, which is why CERT is actually the most difficult one generally to report. Like, for example, Derna al always has much better reporting on civilian casualties. So that was the first issue. Then the other issue was that there were a few embedded journalists with the al bunyan al masus forces, which belonged to the GN GNA and that were supported by, supported by the US campaign. 
uh, those journalists went exactly neutral as they were embedded. So they were both pro-government journalists that didn't really report on civilian harm. So there were only very few Libyan journalists who made it in, um, who reported on, on the whole issue, but also reported afterwards on what hospitals and so on said, how many civilian casualties and injured people they had received. Um, then we had a few tweets and so on, which were mostly picking up on extremist materials on, from telegram channels and so on, from ISIS who, who were reporting on civilian casualties there. So that was always the source worth checking out. And um, yeah, apart from that, like very, very few social media sources, for example, doctors or so on, who reported there. But uh, yeah, as I said, compared to other cities, it was really difficult to gather information from CERT. I'd like to very briefly talk about CERT. In the CERT campaign was different, and you're absolutely right um, to characterize as different. Um, it was done in an extremely dynamic way in which US people operating closely with Libyan people, and I can't be more specific, but in great collaboration, uh, were operating dynamically based on information they were getting from the field. So you would see something happening on the ground. There's a sniper over there. The sniper over there is attacking Libyan forces here. That is, forces who are from Ms. Misrata and Tripolitani who are trying to retake CERT. And on that basis, something would then be attacked. So it's like a war environment in which there was close, close co uh, collaboration between the Libyan forces that were, um, were operating with the support of and, uh, and, and allegiance to the government of the National Accord that we recognized uh, and the US airstrikes. So it was a very, quite a special and close dynamic relationship. Um, and also worth saying, by the way, that mm. the, the many civilian casualties at CERT resulting from ISIS actions. I mean, ISIS were using suicide bombers, snipers. They were trapping civilians in neighborhoods. You know, the, the, the civilian harm was coming from all quarters. It was not just as a result of incoming fire. So, mm. so, the, go so the goal was to extirpate, exterminate, destroy the ability of uh, the Islamic State to control any territory in Libya to control any territory and exploit it. And they left. Some, of them, some were killed. Others simply fled and disappeared uh, back into the desert. Um, the difficulty then is, as you follow up on that, how do you know exactly what happened? How do you do adequate oversight over what happened? Who are the people who should be doing it? How do you assess all the information available? What's the mechanism for assessment? And what's the mechanism for being transparent about it? And they were in the U.S. government, um, the military, the people who were doing the strikes and the people who did the assessments. And for people at the State Department or the White House, we would rely on their assessments of what they learned and didn't learn. What I can't tell you to this day is where the gaps lacunae, uh, and lacunae were, what was invisible to the United States that should have been visible. I can't assess it. I think uh, one of the values... Sorry, Chris, uh, just really quickly. In, in terms of uh, U.S. transparency on this subject, what uh, does the U.S. Um, report every strike? What has your experience been in following up on, on airstrikes? Well, you know, Eric Schmidt uh, ran a great piece in the New York Times earlier this year, picking up on the, there has been a shift uh, in the current administration to them not declaring some of the strikes in, in Libya. So until the Times pushed in, I think they'd held back four of the eight strikes mm -hmm. that are taking place under the, the current administration. We, we are talking about a, a, a relatively small number of strikes. I, I, just coming back to your point, I, I, I think it's likely that we're looking at relatively low levels of civilian harm from AFRICOM strikes for all the reasons that we talked about, other than CERT, which does remain to some degree a question mark. But I do think it's entirely unrealistic for AFRICOM to claim zero civilian harm in any year, including 2011, by the way. AFRICOM has not declared any civilian harm from the, the, the NATO campaign either that I'm aware of in Libya. And I think that still is a challenge for us. We're getting the transparency from AFRICOM, but we're not getting the accountability. And, and I hope that this kind of study uh, at least puts the position of Libyans themselves on the table so that AFRICOM have another point of reference rather than just their own intelligence. I think it's incre I mean, incredibly useful to see the work that you've done. It's information that was never available to me when I was doing the job or since or from any other source. It is different from the internal assessments the military have given us and all of you. I want to give one quick anecdote, which is we used to, after a terrorist strike against a very high value terrorist target, everybody wanted to know, well, uh, was the uh, terrorist killed or not? 
We had situations where we didn't know for a very long time the answer to that question. And we had situations in which the answer was, yes, we're absolutely certain, one agency would say. Another part of the government would say, we're not certain that they're right. And later on, it would turn out that the person who'd been killed was very much alive and still doing bad things. So the process of trying to figure this out, even when you're focused on somebody you know you're paying attention to, can be uh, very, very tricky in terms of actually getting the information and reaching an assessment. So I want to pull back a little bit and talk about um, the GNI and the LNA. They're, they're the, the main factions on the ground in, in Libya. And what, why um, part, of, part of the need for, for airstrikes is, is the militant crisis in Libya and um, the weakness of the GNA and, and its ability to, to combat this threat. Um, how, what, what is, what's creating, where, where's the, the breakdown in, in the GNA being able to, to, to get control of the country and control the, the militant crisis? Well, the Russian government gave the Speaker of the House in the East, a guy from the East who never wanted the government to function, billions of dinars to spend with no accountability and no oversight. They were counterfeit dinars, they were backed by nothing. And in the West, Al Siraj was at that moment unwilling to say they're all counterfeit because there was a liquidity crisis and people didn't have dinars to, 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 they could get out of banks anywhere. And so in, in this particular case, my advice was rejected, which is you declare those dinars counterfeit because you're, you're going to have a terrible problem if somebody's got six billion, whatever the number was, dinars to spend. Um, give me six billion, I can prevent a whole lot of um, uh, civil accord. <laughs> uh, I can stir up a lot of trouble. So Haftar, and Aguila got all of this money. It wasn't the only money they got. They also raided the local banks. So they could do what they wanted. So the problem with the government of the National Court is it doesn't control an army. The army fell apart into militias. The arms, the, the arms were grabbed by militias and widely distributed. The militias are all paid. You could fight. Um, we could all be fighting one another on the street with our guns and all get our paychecks the next week, despite the fact that we're fighting with one another from the same government. This, this is crazy, but it is why the country can sustain civil conflict, because they're all being paid by Libyan oil and there's no differentiation. There have been no consequences for anybody who doesn't recognize the government. And the government needs to have national institutions, and every time it's tried to create it, it's failed. And what are uh, the levels of uh, accountability? So the GNA was, was part of a, a UN negotiation. So what are the levels of accountability there for, for supporting you know, rival forces, for supporting the LNA? There's evidence that, the, that France has, has supported the LNA, that UAE, that, that Egypt. The United States took the position while I was a in, 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 uh, special envoy that we would not support any military group that, uh, unless that group was part of the government that we um, recognized. Other countries took a different position. Everybody denied that they were providing military support um, to Haftar. Um, they were providing weapons to Haftar. They were doing anything with Haftar other than participating in reconnaissance. Uh, the French ambassador told me that the articles I read in Le Monde um, um, were, uh, about what the French were doing were, weren't true because the French were not involved in that area. And um, does, what does our, our data say? Well, the Le Monde article was very detailed and specific, and some French um, uh, uh, um, intelligence guys wound up dying in a plane crash soon thereafter, exactly where the article said that they were working. But the French ambassador told me none of it was true. Um, are there, how many French strikes are in the database, and where, where, are they, where do they appear to be conducting strikes? Uh, so we have, uh, we have clearly attributed five strikes to France, and then we have a lot of contested events of which a lot actually resulted in civilian harm. So there's a lot of alleged civilian harm against France by the small number of strikes they have conducted. And um, the, most of the strikes by them are usually conducted in the south of the country, which can be explained by the uh, interest that France has in uh, the um, situation in the Sahel zone, so the Chad, Mali, and so on in those countries, but there's also a few strikes conducted in the coastal areas in the north. I want to ask you a question about how you think about strikes. If General Haftar and the LNA are doing strikes and the strikes are being fed in real time by intelligence acquired um, from, say, the French, we'll leave others out of this for the moment, just pretend the French because we know the French were involved in that area because of the uh, special forces guys or intel guys who got killed. 
Would you call that an LNA strike? Or you call that an LNA and a Fred strike? It's a, it's a complicated one. It, it, it's, uh, so in, in the war against Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, the, the, it, the, it's generally taken that the, the, person who, the, the nation that drops the bomb has responsibility. But Australia recently actually conceded, uh, and, and they broke precedent, actually. they changed precedent. They, they, they conceded the strike that they had provided the faulty intelligence for, but they hadn't actually conducted the strike, which I thought was an interesting move by Australia and, and, and quite a welcome one. As you say, ISR is hugely important to this. We know the UAE is providing a great deal. We know that France is, uh, and that is feeding into these strikes by Haftar, uh, you know, the, the, the basically proxy strikes. Uh, and also quite inaccurate strikes as well. We, we, you know, we, we tagged a whole batch of events in the data, which m it, when we look at Iraq and Syria, uh, really give us cause for concern. But we didn't see civilian harm reported out on the ground. But for example, we might see the LNA hit nine neighborhoods uh, of, of Derna on the same day. That, that's very troubling. The, there are a couple of possibilities with the Derna raids. One possibility is they're getting bad ISR. Mm. Another possibility is they don't have any ISR. Yeah. And uh, they're doing it through um, uh, instinct and feel, uh, such as it is. Um, on the ISR question, it would be an interesting question for research to determine what ISR capability the Libyan National Army, which is not the National Libyan Army, but is the Libyan National Army, uh, Mr. Haftar, uh, what ISR they've got of their own. Uh, do they have radar of their own? Do they have um, satellite uh, uh, information of their own? It's an interesting question. If they don't, where are they getting it? I think, I think one of the things that fascinated us uh, on the transparency side was how many of the strikes the LNA was declaring. And we wondered whether th this was the LNA almost um, mirroring US transparency as a way of claiming legitimacy. Uh, it's unusual for, for an actor like the LNA to declare its action so overtly. And, and I think they declared about 800 airstrikes in total. And where do they get the planes? Uh, well, I think yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah. Um, so before we, we turn to, to questions to the audience, I want to ask uh, you all, actually, you know, what, what are your projections for the continuation of this conflict? But also, you know, what is the significance of the airstrikes? Is this, you know, is this something to, to be concerned about? Is this a... Um, is this something that, that people should be more invested in? Um, it's definitely something to be concerned about in terms of IHL because Libya is basically free for all at the moment and can see how, ma how many belligerents are involved there. So it's definitely an issue that you know, countries just see the opportunity there to hit whatever target they want and uh, conduct airstrikes there. In terms of projections for the conflict, like the, the current political situation, it's definitely interesting as, the, as the, all the parties uh, agreed in Paris now to have elections in December. Um, a lot of people say they could be premature and the country is not ready for democratic ele elections. Haftar already said that uh, Libya is not ready for democracy. Uh, so people say if Haftar doesn't win the election, he might find a different way to rule the country again. On the other hand, there's his poor health, health condition. So um, yeah, he, he had a stroke and like some, some sources even reported him dead a while ago. So no one uh, knows what his health situation in the future is gonna be like, but um, it's definitely gonna remain interesting also given all the other actors that um, don't have air forces there. Actually, there's so many militias, so many Islamist forces, many jihadi forces that all are actually quite similar in, in their ideologies, but still split up into various factions. The only entity that's using airstrikes in Libya these days to conquer territory is the Libyan National Army of General Haftar. Everybody else's are fundamentally uh, counterterrorism. And it's important, I think, to distinguish that which is there to conquer territory mm -hmm. and that which is counterterrorism. It's not the same. Thing, exactly. That's why it's such an interesting question where the source of the uh, of his uh, aircraft comes from, um, the source of his ISR, and so on, because that raises some very big questions. Um, Haftar told me, and his sons and military advisor told me, that he intended to 
uh, the best thing for Libya would be for all the um, beards to use this physical expression to describe the Islamists as beards. Um, if they all were in prison, um, exiled or dead, and he said, I think we could all agree that dead would be best. His, um, I said, I didn't think we could all agree that. Um, he then, his uh, sons and the military advisor told me soon before I was leaving that he was going to conquer the rest of the country and take over Libya by a mixture of conquest and acclaim by December 2016. Um, fire all of the politicians, because they were all useless. Eliminate all Libya's politicians. Rule by military decree until Libya was ready for democracy at some distant date in the future. Since most countries aren't ready for democracy, I assume that would be more or less as long as he was around. Um, that was his vision. He was very clear about it. Um, there was no ambiguity. Uh, he was going to correct the arc of history so it would be him, not um, Gaddafi all those years. He'd been back, of course, part of the, of the group of military people as part of the original overthrow of King Idris in 1969. So that was his vision, and he would have civilians be responsible for health care and education and that kind of thing. Right. So his airstrikes are in support of that vision, mm -hmm. uh, which is in part a vision of military governors running the country. And I think it's important to differentiate that from airstrikes that are um, uh, counter-terrorist in nature or attacking the Islamic State. Uh, I think it's a really big distinction. Airstrikes have their problems regardless of the goals for the reasons of identification and civilian loss, and you're far away from it. But in a Libya-specific context, it's an important thing to keep the distinctions in mind. That uh, distinction is quite important, and um, especially in, in identifying you know, who is m the most responsible for, for civilian deaths. And part of doing that is increasing accountability um, among all participants, including the ones who are going after militants. And Chris, I want to give you the final word. Mm. Um, how, do we, how do we do that? How do we increase transparency among all actors, and, and where, where would we like to be? I, I think it's, it's troubling that if we look at all airstrikes in Libya since 2011, uh, the, the NATO intervention and the, the, the seven years since that we've looked at for this study, not one actor, foreign or domestic, has ever conceded civilian harm in one event. And that, that is uh, not acceptable. Uh, we wouldn't accept that in other conflicts. It, it's, it's as if we permit things in Libya that we, 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 we would be concerned about elsewhere. And as Oliver mentioned, the country has become a free-for-all. We bring this back to the security of Libyans themselves. It's what they most crave. It's what they most wanted since 2011. And, and in many ways, we're no closer to helping them uh, reach that point. And in fact, many um, in, in international powers are interfering in Libya in multiple ways, not just directly through airstrikes, but, but, but as you were saying, through the funding and through the, the back channels and so on. Um, one way we can help Libyans is, is to keep in mind that, that, that their security uh, situation does matter, that the decisions taken in foreign ministries elsewhere impact on them, and that an airstrike is, is really not necessarily the answer. Um, th that would be my point. Great, thank you so much. Um, let's take some audience questions. Uh, we have a mic, wait for it to come around to you. We have Peter in the front. Well, th Jonathan, thank you for the masterclass on the history of Libya since uh, the NATO intervention. Um, I mean, it's complicated, but you, you uh, explained it very well. So what do we, I mean, what, what is the solution to the conflict? I mean, what, are, what is a sort of plausible, non fairy tale sort of solution uh, that, that might make this kind of discussion moot? Three things. First, you have to have one peace process, political process, not multiple ones, so people don't forum shop. So the UN has to be the source of the solutions, has to be UN-led. Second, the sponsoring states need to tell their clients, you have to deal, you have to deal now, and we will not support you further if you don't uh, uh, become part of this process. Third, the process has to result in the distribution of economic benefits at the local level throughout the country um, where, where there's any meaningful population and ideally should get down to the south as well. Libya makes enough money from its oil that there's more than enough money to go around, even with a dollop of corruption built in patronage, through, for patronage networks. 
um, if the political agreement is, incorporates the needs of different regions. If it incorporates the needs of di different regions, it becomes counterproductive to bomb. At that point, you are just, you are, uh, you're taking away from consensus, and you're threatening interests that are actually part of the deal if everybody's good benefits from the deal. So that's the solution, and the personal ambitions of individual Libyans need uh, to be countered to the extent that they're different from that deal. The only other solution besides the one I've just articulated, in which early elections would be just fine, because they, they would then be enforced not only domestically but internationally, is the strongman coming in to replace Gaddafi. And that was General Haftar's vision, he told me directly to my face that was his vision in the summer 2016. Um, and um, back in 2016, I didn't know of any country, including Egypt, the Emirates, anyone, who thought that was a viable solution for Libya, that that would work, as opposed to create civil conflict. I told General Haftar if he, if he wants to hold power in Libya as a country, he should get himself elected, submit to civilian rule for the time being, participate in elections, and Libyan people would decide, not the United States or anybody else. Um, I still think that is the right solution. When people say Libya is not ready for elections, it depends what happens afterwards and how the internationals enforce the elections. After the government of national accord came into place, what happened? The Russians came in and gave two actors billions of Libyan dinars worth billions of US dollars to do with whatever they wanted. What did they do? They said, oh, we're not going to pay any attention to the government in the West. That's what Russia did. It played a fundamental role. Meanwhile, Haftar continued to get military support from various countries without having to support the government. So he didn't. So um, while the Libyans play their, play their games, everybody does. If I can get you to take care of me so I don't have to work anymore, and you'll beat up on that guy over there because he doesn't treat, doesn't say nice things to me, I might do that. But you're not going to do that. I wouldn't do that to you anyway. Um, uh, but you're not going to do that. But, but, but that's what the internationals wind up doing with, the, with their Libyan clients. It's very destructive. The playing off of internationals against one another by Libyans, very destructive. The playing off of Libyans against one another by internationals, very destructive. You really have to adopt an approach of what's good for the whole country if you're going to um, counter the risks of civil conflict. And if you did that, you would wind up with a much smaller number of airstrikes because the only airstrikes at that point would be Libyan-endorsed airstrikes, endorsed by the Libyan government, which was a requirement for the US airstrikes, by the way, I got every member of the Presidency Council individually to say, yes, we want you to do this. We need you to do this. When I said I got them, I asked them. I said, this is what we want to do, but we need your permission. They all said yes before we did anything. So we didn't just do it to them. So you have to get endorsement from the government. You need the endorsement from the government to be in public before you begin. You need to work closely with them on the ground. If you're working closely with them on the ground, you can then do the follow-up that you want on things like civilian, and it then becomes subject to a political test. If you're killing a bunch of people on the ground or innocent people, that's going to create problems for the government as well as for the foreign state. It's not going to be sustainable. So it creates corrective mechanisms to protect people in a humanitarian sense. That's the right way for it to happen, but it does require a functioning integrated national government to begin to happen and no more bombing for conquest. Thanks. Let's, let's see if we can take another question right over here. Hi. Um, uh, thanks to all the panelists. Candice Rondo, a senior fellow here at New America. Uh, also, congratulations. I know that uh, that kind of work, uh, data intensive, is very difficult to do and um, very sad to see that our Libyan colleagues were not able to join us today. Um, Jonathan, a question for you, if you could um, unpack a little bit more uh, some of the Russian motivations uh, beyond um, sort of the obvious, which is sort of the, the near-term support for LNA and Haftar. Um, what is the broader sort of uh, implication of Russian uh, backing of, of Haftar uh, for not only the U.S., but I think the region writ large? Uh, what should we expect? I also want to sort of also point out that actually it's very interesting that you mentioned the sort of the counterfeiting of, of dinars because that was a method that was used in Afghanistan in the 1980s uh, with uh, the Russians backing their own um, proxies there as, as well. So I didn't know that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, Russia was constructive in 2014, 2015, and in 2013 it was less important but still constructive. They complained about us going in, they complained about NATO, but they helped us with solutions. 
the Kremlin made a decision sometime in 2016 to play a more a destructive role. And it took me months to see what they were doing as systematic, and it was systematic. I believe that they uh, wanted to prevent Hillary Clinton from having a victory in Libya. They wanted to prevent Obama from having victories anywhere. And that their uh, approach in Libya was opportunistic to increase their influence, to prevent uh, there being any further progress until US elections were over, um, and to deny, to, to deny wins um, for, for these two, two people Putin had hatred and contempt for. Um, that's what I think was going on. It's not just about the United States, but it wasn't part about the United States. Um, Russia n needs to be part of any solution. We, there will be no solution if Russia and the United States are on opposite sides. Russia, China, the United States, UK, and France, the Perm Five need to be aligned. Algeria needs to be a core part of the solution with its view of non-intervention, which is correct. Tunisia needs to be part of it. Egypt needs to be part of it in ways that, makes, that helps Egypt protect its border. The Emirates can be extremely constructive and helpful um, so long as they feel that there's not a threat of terrorism being exported or Islamist instability. Um, and so you, you can bring everybody in, and Russia is going to be critical to that, as it, was, um, it played a substantial role in being destructive in 2016. Thank you. Uh, David, right here. Thanks. Um, at the beginning, you mentioned the maritime strikes. Can you speak a bit more about that as that, as you said, seems to be something new and both in sort of the extension of the conflict into surrounding waters and seas, but also um, sort of non-state or sub-state um, splinters of the state conducting um, combat operations both from the air and um, on the water seems something. We're seeing more of here and in Yemen, um, and is under discussed. Thanks. Um, yeah, so what we could add about the maritime strikes, apart from what, it, what I've said before, so uh, they're, they're mostly usually conducted by the, um, by the local forces, so I think most of the allegations, so maybe even all of them we had there were against the LNA or the GNA, or I think also the GNC back in the day and it's often uh, oil tankers that get uh, that get hit in the strikes then as i mentioned like on the civilian side we often have allegations that uh, fisher boats were hit for example or that just uh, refugee boats for example were hit instead of the smugglers or the terrorists that were uh, like it was claimed by the belligerents back then uh, these were actually often also strikes that were commented on at least on in terms of civilian harm by the local factions uh, they then often just say uh, the boat was carrying weapons, the boat was carrying fighters or something like this. And um, yeah, it's clearly an issue here because Libya has such a large coast so in Syria and Iraq, which, which both don't have much of a coast. Uh, we, we haven't seen many strikes like this. So it was a new issue for us. It's uh, definitely difficult in terms of geolocating because there's often no clear location for it. So you can often just vaguely put it into the water and uh, it's difficult to track in terms of filming and photography as well if a uh, strike happen in the water where, where no one can take uh, pictures or, or films or something. Uh, so yeah, it was a new issue for us. Uh, right up here. Um, thank you so much for all of your valuable research in this extremely relevant discussion. Uh, my name is Sabrina Harris. I'm with the UNIC. And I was just wondering if each of you could kind of discuss your evaluation of the role that the special support mission in Libya has played since its um, creation in 2011. If you think the UN has been effective in, in peace building, attempting to protect civilians, or what you would like to see out of it moving forward. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, yeah, I, I, I'm, so the, 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 there can be huge variation between the quality of UN missions. And, and actually, I think UNSMIL has been quite focused and committed around civilian harm. Uh, there were some discussions a few years back about which model of civilian harm monitoring UNSMIL would, would adopt. Uh, and we were pleased to see that they went for the Afghan model, uh, which is pretty much the, the, the gold standard in terms of UN missions and, and civilian harm monitoring. Um, UNSMIL has been very good at foregrounding um, uh, civilian harm events and airstrikes routinely topping their list of concerns. 
uh, really because of their destructive power. You know, there's a lot of violence going on at ground level. This isn't, you know, the, the issue in Libya is by no means just about airstrikes, but as we all know, airstrikes can deliver great destruction, um, uh, and, and that is a particular challenge. So I, th I think from, from our position at Air Wars, we, we've seen UNSMEL's engagement on a, on a micro level, on, you know, engagement on behalf of civilians as being very strong. They made a, a very strong intervention recently um, in the siege of uh, Derna uh, that just concluded with Haftar seizing that city. Um, so, uh, so that's the micro. How they're doing on a broader level, I, I, I couldn't really say. But on, on the very specific issue of civilian harm, I think they've, they've been uh, better than missions, for example, of the UN and Iraq have been quite challenging. Uh, Unspell is under-resourced for the scope of its mission, which is practically everything. It also had problems with security, where portions of Libya, and for a time all of Libya were viewed to be, uh, viewed to be as non-secure because of the inability of any Libyan government to protect you if you ran into trouble. In order for UNSMIL to function effectively, it needs to have a lot of people in a lot of places in Libya, and they need to be financially supported to enable to do their job. All of that has been under severe constraint and has gotten worse over time rather than better. That's a problem. Um, any other questions? Hi, uh, my name is uh, Jack Rapansky, unaffiliated. Uh, two, quick, two quick questions. First is, uh, is there a lot of consistency in the definition of the word strike, like CENTCOM uses fuzzy meanings and, and how is that in your database? Uh, and then the, uh, uh, oh, go on that, that one first. And strike is a really challenging term. I mean, the US military don't like the term internally. They'll talk about a kinetic event or an incident involving the release of one or more munitions. So it can be a very vague term. In Libya, so in Iraq and Syria, a strike might involve multiple aircraft from multiple partner nations dropping multiple munitions. In Libya, it tends to be a much narrower focus. Uh, far fewer munitions released per strike as well as far as we can see. So often a strike is one munition, at most two. Uh, but you can get sequences of strikes over the city. So it's, um, it's, it's probably closer to the public expectation of what a strike is in Libya than in any conflict that we've taken a look at. Uh, but it's still quite a, a challenging term in terms of, I, I know every time I talk to US military officials, they're like, why do you talk about strikes? And then, of course, in their own public reports, they report strikes. So, um, you know, it's become a shorthand, but not a very helpful one sometimes. See if I can, rem see, see if I can remember the other question. I think it was about the Russians. Uh, so we talked about uh, the run-up to the election, but since the election, have the, has the Russian involvement evolved or just kind of proceeded on the same trajectory? Um, the, uh, the Russians continue to provide dinars for a period of time, the best of my knowledge. And I've identified that as a critical way of messing things up. They've continued to have talks with a wide range of Libyan actors. I think that's fine, potentially really good, if they're telling them all they need to come to terms with one another. But a substantial portion of what Russia has been doing in recent years has been seeing where it can increase its influence and reduce US influence. And while that's a normal thing for a nation state to do, it may not be good for Libya in a Libya context, because Libya needs to have the alignment of all the outside actors in support of a common approach uh, through the UN. It's not about the United States, and it can't be about the United States. And so if it's about the United States and Russia and they're in contrary places, that's a problem. I would hope that um, Mr. Putin would see the Trump administration as uh, a, a, an administration that can work with on Libya in full alignment in pursuit of common goals, uh, as it has in so many other areas. Got a question over here. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Beatrice March and I'm from um, the State Department. So I was wondering how the mixed migration of um, West Africans has affected the political stability um, in Libya and the counter-terrorist efforts there. The smuggling networks in Libya are very ancient. Um, this is how they earned a living. Uh, barter and trade is how these people have earned living, go, li living long before there was a the United States. And it hasn't changed that much. 
What changes is how you earn a living in terms of what it is you're moving. Are, are you moving dates? Um, are you moving uh, people? They're now moving people and earning a living that way. So the smuggling networks have, have fostered growing criminal networks, which tie in to some extent with terrorist networks. We've seen some Boko Haram engagement you know, all the way up to Libya out of Nigeria, for example. And so all of that's problematic. It's more problematic for the way in which it is destabilizing neighbors, uh, the migrant trade, uh, destabilizing um, the EU, and for the fact that it's causing tremendous humanitarian injury to the people who are being trafficked. So they think of them as um, traditional networks to earn a living, which have nothing wrong with them, becoming um, criminalized as a result of push-pull factors that are um, trans-border. Libya has no functioning border system. The EU did everything it could to try and help them get one after the fall of Gaddafi. It was one of the many types of security programs that uh, Libyans were incapable of working with different donors to, to carry out. Every single one of those programs failed. It didn't matter who was offering it. It didn't matter whether you were Turkey or Egypt. It didn't matter whether you were France, the UK, the United States, Italy, or anybody else. They all failed. And there were a wide range of them. So Libya needs to have security institutions that function. That gets back to the need for integrated government. In terms of the humanitarian issues, Europe would be much better, much better off if it had spent money investing in uh, facilities in um, northern Libya which essentially would involve handouts, payments to the locals in return for allowing processing of refugees um, and their handling there. And also they should be spending the money to build out a Coast Guard, which is desperately needed. Hi, up here. Um, Chris, um, a question for you, just focusing on accountability. It's a two-part question. One is when there is acknowledgement that civilians have been killed by airstrikes, it's oftentimes written off as this is just the consequence of war. Mm -hmm. And so I want to get your thoughts, one, on that response. Is it justified? Um, and second to that, what would accountability look like in an ideal scenario when a country does take responsibility for civilian casualties? Yeah. I think if, if one of the things we argue a lot with Iraq and Syria is if we, if, if we can't start to get accountability, we, we, we can't get, then we get to to, give, to bring the numbers down. I mean, uh, understanding how, when, and where civilians are being harmed is really important to that. In, with OIR, for example, in Iraq and Syria, we have a willing partner. The, the, the coalition will work with uh, us and does to quite a significant extent. And, uh, you know, we work to improve that understanding. The coalition uh, has admitted almost a 1,000 civilian fatalities in a hot war, which is pretty much unprecedented. We're just not seeing that translated across to Libya. And I think, you know, the, the choice of the report title for Alyssa and, and Peter's report, Lawless Skies, really does capture what we're seeing in Libya. And I think for broader security concerns uh, and precedents being set, we should be deeply troubled that Libya has become this free-for-all where any country can go and carry out an airstrike with impunity. They don't even feel they have to declare it. Uh, most foreign powers bombing in Libya don't bother to declare it. Uh, and nobody takes responsibility for civilian harm. So in a sense, it runs deeper than our modeling of other conflicts where uh, in Libya, we, we, we know what Libyans themselves are reporting out. We know where the civilians are being harmed, but with such a sort of profound lack of accountability, um, which doesn't reflect the other kind of conflicts that, that for example, Air Wars has modeled, um, that's an issue. It kind of reminds me of, of the, the US denials around strikes in, in Pakistan prior to a sort of more coherent response uh, in the second uh, Obama administration term. You know, there was just an outright denial. We're not harming civilians. And that didn't match anyone's understanding. Um, and again, it just brings it back to, to ordinary uh, Libyans. The, uh, the three, uh, Oliver showed the, the, the latest uh, US claim. Um, Locals are absolutely adamant that an ISIS commander was killed. Nobody's disputing that that ISIS commander died. But what locals are telling us and reporting out is that actually the three people who died with him that day were family members who did not participate in hostilities. Um, AFRICOM has just said no. Uh, and, and I think we, we will continue to have these challenges between the public perception uh, and the military perception and that's in the case of the one military who will actually talk to us. You know, the other seven belligerents won't, 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 won't say a damn thing, and, and that's a great pity.
Uh, we have time for one more question. All right. Well, I think that's it. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for talking to us about the study. Thank you. Real well, pleasure. Really well done. Um, uh, you're doing.